I am New York. Yes, I'm New York. I am New York. Yo soy Nueva York. Solo New York. Just we New York. We are New York. Welcome to Diverse City, where we explore New York's eclectic enclaves one neighborhood at a time. I'm Zyphus Lebrun. This month, we're heading to Jackson Heights, Queens, a community that's been called one of the most diverse neighborhoods in New York City and the world. 60% of the population here is foreign-born. A 2019 report from the State Controller's Office credits that population with energizing the local economy. Despite this boom in small businesses, there's been reports that high rents are leading to high business turnover. There's also the issue of affordable housing. The NYU Furman Center reported that more than 10% of households in the Greater Jackson Heights area are severely overcrowded. More recently, the region was hit hard during the COVID-19 pandemic, when nearby Elmhurst Hospital became the epicenter of the disease in New York City. On this episode, ICE age, pushing back against immigration enforcement tactics that some say are unlawful. Open Streets, a pilot program that's brought much needed relief from the woes of the pandemic. And quick as a wink, a local mascot with a quirky tail. Those stories and more coming up as we explore Jackson Heights, Queens. As I mentioned at the top of the show, much of the population in Jackson Heights consists of immigrants. That's made for a sometimes contentious relationship with Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE, over their attempts to arrest and deport undocumented individuals. In light of that, a group of Jackson Heights activists have developed a kind of pro-immigrant counter-surveillance system to help push back against some of the unlawful tactics used by ICE agents. Shannon Ayala has that story. My name is Tania Matos. I'm from Queens United. Tanya Matos is a co-founder of the grassroots group Queens Neighborhoods United. They do an action called Ice Watch, an all-volunteer patrol that keeps tabs on U.S. Immigration Customs Enforcement, or ICE. Being from this neighborhood and growing up in this neighborhood, uh, you are more than likely an immigrant. And so it was, ICE is a very constant presence in our lives, uh, whether if it's through our family, through ourselves, or through our, our friends and community members. Jackson Heights Ice Watch started in early 2016 as a result of the Obama administration's increased deportations. Statistics show that the Department of Homeland Security repatriated between three and 400,000 undocumented immigrants a year between 2009 and 2016. Under Obama, if uh, a home rate, let's say ICE came to somebody's house and they were looking for somebody, they would leave the family, the rest of the family alone. Under Trump, they can pick up anyone who's undocumented. The Immigration Defense Project maps reports of ICE raids in the New York City area. The research found that many of the raids are clustered in Jackson Heights and other neighborhoods. The map shows there were at least three known raids in Jackson Heights in early 2020. There's a tone in the neighborhood where everybody wants to collaborate. So a business owner may tell us, I spotted ICE last week here. And so we're able to sort of pinpoint exactly maybe the trends that have been happening in the neighborhood or work backwards to see where an ice raid may have happened. Ice Watch comes from Cop Watch, a strategy of catching police interactions on camera to document brutality. The idea has become widely known through spontaneous actions of filming violent police interactions with smartphones. But Mato says Ice Watch is more systematic. The main idea of Ice Watch is to um, is to capture ICE officers, their badge number, the license plates of their cars, and to understand who they are and what they're doing there. Mato says Ice Watch is organized with trainings and teams that can vary from a handful to up to 50 people who take to the streets before sunrise. ICE officers are only allowed to enter your home if they have your permission. Advocates say that Ice Watch is especially important at a time when there's reported anecdotes that agents are using unlawful tactics, such as posing as cops, 
or other tricks to get suspects to open the door. Those issues were raised in a recent immigrants' rights webinar hosted by State Assembly Member-Elect Jessica Gonzalez Rojas. It, it's really important to know that there's there must be like a warrant warrant presented, and um, they can't just knock on your door and take you, right? They they have to present um, a warrant, and you know that's something that a lot of people don't know. Um, and again, if they're not presenting themselves as as ICE, they're presenting themselves as police. Um, we've heard stories where they've said, you know, we just want to talk to you, um, and then. That's, you know, kind of a false entry, and and that's really unjust. The Department of Homeland Security has not responded to a request for comment. But after an October raid, an ICE field office director said, let us not gloss over the fact that the vast majority of the individuals arrested during this operation have criminal histories. Mato says she doesn't buy into the criminal record argument. We understand the criminal justice system very well in the neighborhood um, because some of us have experienced it, have been through the criminal justice system or have been through the immigration system. So we know it is a very, very skewed um, system that are are not in our favor. So um, we we do ice watch and it doesn't matter whether somebody has a criminal um, conviction for us. Mayor de Blasio is pushing for ICE to stop posing as NYPD. Last summer, the state passed the Protect Our Courts Act which bans ICE from making arrests at courts without a warrant. Gonzalez Rojas says she wants to expand it to other spaces like schools, hospitals, and transit hubs. For Diverse City, this is Shannon Ayala. Jackson Heights was created by the Queensborough Corporation in the early 20th century. The investor group brought a unique European style to the apartments and landscape of the area. The Garden Apartment has now become synonymous with the neighborhood. Greg Thompson tells us more. In 1910, a group of investors led by a man named Edward A. McDougall began purchasing land in what was then called Trains Meadows, with an eye towards building a new community targeted to middle-class Manhattanites. And what they started to do, which was what most other developers did, was to simply put in the grid and then sell lots. Daniel Karatsis is the author of Jackson Heights, A Garden in the City, a deep historical dive into the neighborhood. While researching the book, he discovered that the Queensborough Corporation made a drastic change to their plans for the 350 acres. The investors took a trip to a few European cities, and what they saw altered their plans entirely. So they changed their focus of development from small-scale things to larger developments. What they saw in Europe was the garden apartment, large apartment buildings that ran a block long and surrounded a garden interior with trees, flowers, and benches. Green space was not just confined to the interior. Parks and other open spaces were built nearby. They coined the term garden apartment for the development that we now know as the Greystones, where they set aside land both in front and back of the building for the shared use of the residents. And the apartments themselves went front to back. The buildings were only one apartment deep. This change in plans has defined the look and feel of Jackson Heights ever since the Queensborough Corporation started erecting apartment buildings. Jackson Heights was built denser from the start. Garden apartments were four to six stories, the private homes sort of less dense. The focus was on the apartment rather than the house for many years. Though it's now known as one of the most ethnically diverse neighborhoods in the world, Jackson Heights was originally an exclusive domain. It was obvious when you read the Jackson Heights news that the prices that they were charging for the apartments and the houses were outside the reach of most recent immigrants, um, people of color. That was accelerated when the concept of cooperative apartments encouraged the vetting of buyers. It also would allow them to create a homogeneous restricted community because by selling co-ops and board approval, they could then create a sort of country club suburban-like community in the midst of New York City with its own golf course and tennis club and clubhouse and clubs and all of that, and it all worked. But after the Great Depression, the Queensborough Corporation needed money and buyers, and so they expanded their marketing to a wider group of people. 
They built their last building in 1949, but the impact of their efforts was so significant, a large section of Jackson Heights was made a New York City historic district in 1999. To me, what the success of the Queensboro Corporation was is the quality of the housing stock. And a very non-technical term is that it's been a relatively pleasant place to live in terms of the scale and the fact that the buildings do blend in with one another. In a city that's a big mishmash of stuff coming at you, it's nice to come home to something that's relatively pleasant and human scaled. That's what we have here. That the type of housing really works for a city like New York and continues to work for a city like New York. Unfortunately, it's uneconomic to build this way any longer. And so that's why we should be happy with what we have here, the Sunnyside Gardens, Forest Hills Gardens, sort of Brownstone, Brooklyn, and other neighborhoods that have been become historic districts because otherwise, if you allow it to be the free for all for the developers, it's gonna become a city that nobody wants to live in. For Diverse City, I'm Craig Thompson. A newer addition to the ever-growing South Asian community in the area are Nepalese. It's estimated that more than 10,000 Nepalese live in the neighborhood. Bruno Giuliani reports on how some members of that community have stepped up to help others during the COVID-19 crisis. Our community makes a big part of the economy, the local economy here in Queens, because we are, like, we are one of the fastest growing communities in Queens, New York. Uh, there's a main market here, the Indian market, where two blocks uh, block away from this uh, main junction. We have a community center, we have a community building here, and upstairs uh, is we have a Buddhist temple, and downstairs we have, we have a huge one meeting hall. The community center is also the home of the United Sherpa Association. It was created to preserve and develop Nepali and Sherpa language, culture, and religion while creating stronger ties with other communities. When the first COVID-19 case hit New York City, the organization canceled all its programming and focused on serving the neighborhood. People were scared and panicked. The Elmer's Hospital, which is two blocks away from our community center, was full of patients. There are a lot of ambulances parked outside. There are no beds available. People are lying down on the, on the floor, on the lobbies. And there was tractor tra trailer parked outside the hospital with full of dead bodies. It was indescribable. There are shortages of PPEs. There are no mats, no hand sanitizers. Even the Tylenols and thermometers were gone, no hand, hand gloves. And we started collecting them from many different places. We, we imported them from the domestic market and international market, and we collected them, made care packages to distribute to our community members. And later, when there are a lot of people unemployed, they don't have like unemployment insurance, they don't have the stimulus checks. We started helping them with foods. We made a grocery packages and started delivering to their homes. And we distributed $500 each to the international students and people with like you know, some disabled people who cannot work, who don't have jobs. The result of our early preparation was we were able to save a lot of our community members from this pandemic. On October 24, the United Sherpa Association organized the COVID-19 Champion Awards in their temple to honor the community members who have been making an exceptional contribution to the vulnerable community. Interim Queensboro President Sharon Lee had a few words for the community. I am delighted to join you here tonight uh, to thank you on behalf of the 2.34 million residents who called Queens home. Uh, as you know, we were the epicenter of the epicenter of this global pandemic. 
it feels like lifetimes ago, but it was really just a few months ago. And you were so remarkable in how you came through in our darkest, darkest time. As the city enters a second wave, the Sherpa community is ready to play their part to save lives and start the recovery. Ergen Sherpa stresses the value of selflessness that the Sherpa community conveys in the streets of Jackson Heights. The food pantry is going on. We are distributing food here. We still have hundreds of volunteers helping us. Bruno Giuliani for Diverse City. A group of neighbors in the area have come together to help unite the community during the pandemic. They've created and are managing a safe and open space along 34th Avenue. Crystal Law reports on how the Strip is becoming the defining model of transforming city streets into outdoor recreational space in New York City. 34th Avenue and Jackson Heights was alive with the sounds of the neighborhood this past summer despite concerns over COVID-19, due in part to the Open Streets Initiative. The Open Streets Campaign is a way of creating more space in New York City, which is the densest city uh, in the United States, where a lot of people are living in extremely small spaces. They're packed together. Juan Restrepo is the Queen's Organizer for Transportation Alternatives, or TransAlt a nearly 50-year-old nonprofit that focuses on reclaiming New York City streets for mass transit users, pedestrians, and cyclists. Some of our more notable achievements are helping to bring in bike share into the city, protected bike lane implementation, uh, pedestrian plazas in many communities, and most notably recently, helping to advocate for open streets as a response to the pandemic. So now I'm going to talk about the Open Streets Initiative. Mayor Bill de Blasio announced the Open Streets Initiative last spring. City officials have had success with a similar plan in Times Square. So the effort was to open and expose this form of open street reallocation to other communities throughout New York City as a means of giving residents an outlet during the pandemic's lockdown. Our open streets are from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. And we have a phalanx of, of volunteers every morning that exactly at eight, put down the barricades to open the street to people and close it to cars. Uh, and we do that for the entire like 30 block length from 69th Street all the way up to Junction Boulevard. So the entirety of Jackson Heights. Uh, and that's done like clockwork at 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. Uh, Monday through Friday. Jim Burke is a founding member of the 34th Avenue Open Streets Coalition. His organization works closely with Restrepo to keep the initiative up and running. He is one of an estimated 80 Jackson Heights residents who fought to remake the concept from what the city first proposed. When the mayor uh, announced the Open Street Initiative, originally it was only two blocks long and it was right by our only park, which is maybe almost a mile away from where I live. Uh, and uh, that had on each corner, they had two officers, uh, and it sort of looked like police checkpoints. Burke says that the community wasn't quite receptive to the police presence, and it caused the pilot opening of 34th Avenue to fail. However, this didn't deter the community from trying again. A whole bunch of uh, different neighbors and moms and seniors got together, uh, and we actually closed the street like with a guerrilla action ourselves. Uh, with sandwich boards, I wore orange vest, we directed the traffic, and the world didn't end. The street filled up with little kids and seniors. Uh, kids were playing hopscotch, people just playing in the street. We had uh, the people on the, on the joining buildings were, were cheering us on, uh, and they just loved seeing that. And it was, um, we got DOT's attention and the city's attention. I said, look, this didn't cost a penny, right? It was just some signage and some volunteers. Uh, and uh, we pleaded with the city to, to give us back our open street and to give us a real meaningful one. 
um, because the, the initial one was very small and it was by probably the only upper middle class section of, 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 of our area. Burke says open streets is important to a community like Jackson Heights because it's a welcome bit of fresh air to an area that already lacks park space compared to other neighborhoods throughout Queens. Our sidewalks are like four feet wide or less. Sometimes that there's a tree and a hydrant and other things uh, also blocking that space. And when you were walking in the sidewalk, um, you know, I'm able-bodied, so I would get out of the way when you saw an older person because you saw that they were afraid. They didn't want to not want to get COVID because so many people in our neighborhood were dying of COVID. And that's what open space gave us a sort of a, a reprieve, like, okay, we can breathe, we can walk. And you were kind of starved uh, to see other people. Despite the accolades, Burke says there has been some pushback from neighbors who are concerned about parking on the street and changes in the flow of traffic during open street hours. Restrepo says the only thing standing in the way of Jackson Heights maintaining their open street permanently is how well it performs in the upcoming winter months. Burke confirms they're moving full speed ahead with their regularly scheduled programming. Crystal Low for Diversity. Finally, from us, an unassuming penguin statue sits on a median near the border of Jackson Heights and Elmhurst. Though it may seem out of place, Vanessa Monet tells us that his appearance belies a storied past. If you're not familiar with him, he's a he's about 22 inch high bronze penguin that sits in um, the Elm Jack divider. Jackson Heights resident Jody Shadoff is the creator of Wink the Penguin's Facebook page. She started the page in 2012 as a way of sharing her appreciation for the neighborhood icon. I became fascinated by him and started looking up his history and the more I looked up his history, the more I wanted to record it someplace. And so I created a Facebook page. And I was surprised when he started getting a following and people started posting on the page uh, little events that were happening in the neighborhood and you know sharing resources. So he became even more of a thing. Wink was the brainchild of the late New York City Parks Commissioner, Henry Stern. Stern, who was known to be very quirky, loved animals. The penguin was placed on the Elm Jack Mall to keep drivers from making U-turns over the median at the request of then city councilman, John Sabini. The logic was that Wink is a Magellanic penguin that represents the large South American population in the neighborhood. Wink wasn't always a solo act. He had a twin, but birds of a feather don't always flock together. So there was a penguin on either end of Elm Jack Meridian. And somewhere in the early 2000s, Wink's twin brother disappeared. Whether he was kidnapped, whether he ran away from home, nobody knows because we never heard from him. There was no ransom note. The flightless birds seem to have a habit of taking off. In 2009, Wink disappeared only to be found six months later and eventually returned to his rightful perch on the Elm Jack Mall. Wink's become somewhat of a neighborhood mascot, so much so that local resident Elsie Carballo has taken him under her wing and started dressing him in festive attire for various parades and cultural events, beginning with Colombian Independence Day in 2006. Wink's outfits don't last long. They are there for the holiday, usually in Christmas, a week before, and maybe through New Year's, because he's out there in the elements. So uh, he's out there in the rain, he's out there in the snow, and they are not left until they're bedraggled. At first, no one knew who had been dressing Wink up, but all was revealed in 2016, when Wink and Elsie were honored with a Good Neighbor Award by the Jackson Heights Beautification Group. Over the years, Wink has worn a multitude of outfits and posed for countless photos, but there's one image that stands out to Jody. He's got his little red hat on and he's looking directly at the Roosevelt Avenue, 74th Street Station. And I feel like he's looking over the neighborhood because that's our main hub. And I feel like he's kind of our little guardian penguin. Not actually guardian angel, he's our little guardian penguin that looks over Jackson Heights. Everybody needs someone to look out for them. And we have Wink. 
For Diverse City, I'm Vanessa Monet. That's our look at Jackson Heights in Queens. Join us next time when we'll head to Bushwick, Brooklyn, to find out more about what's going on in that part of our diverse city. Thank you.